blessings and the anointing that's been upon us, the miracles that you have worked in individuals' lives and homes already in this meeting. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for it. It all belongs to you, Lord. You, you have done it. We thank you for it. We submit ourselves afresh and anew this morning for you to speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak to our lives, and enable us, Father, to, to receive from you that we might be fully equipped to participate with you in your kingdom and in your purposes that you might be glorified and that souls might be saved, prepared for the rapture in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, you may be seated. I have to apologize again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to be teaching from a set of notes this morning, as much as I love to do that. Just love to teach from notes. <laughs> uh, that's the instruction and the direction. And uh, I will not be telling you where you can find these notes till I'm done. <laughs> because I don't want you looking at a set of notes and jumping ahead and see where I'm going when I don't know where I'm going. I'm just following and hearing, repeating. But I'll tell you where you can find the notes so you don't have to worry about writing down everything I'm saying, just only if you're, going to, if you're taking notes and you only have to write down things that are uh, specifically uh, pertinent to you or stuff that God's actually telling you instead of writing down what I've said. So... Uh, the uh, subtitle and the back screen is not on. Hello, Adam. The back screen is not on. Thank you. Uh, the subtitle of this call to war is the Great Commissioning. Not the Great Commission, the Great Commissioning. And... Um, There is no place in the scripture that more clearly and specifically uh, details God's intention for us working in his kingdom as can be found in Acts chapter 26 beginning with verse 13 through verse 18. This is Paul recounting to the king his personal calling and commissioning. And I, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't have any desire to find fault with anybody. Okay? And I know that I say things and I teach things that are very different at times than what is practiced commonly in the apostolic movement, currently at least. Uh, but that's what the Bible's for. And the Lord said he would give us understanding line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little as long as we're receiving the next line, as long as we're receiving the next precept, and we're allowing those things to be added to our lives, and we're making the mental, emotional, and spiritual adjustments to following those things as they're being added to our lives. Uh, the Bible says we're to walk in the light as he is in the light. That, that Im implies, strongly implies progressive revelation. And I'm going to say you say to you very pointedly, as directly as I know how, it does not matter how much clarity and absolute 100% fullness of revelation on salvation doctrine we have, on, 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 on Godhead doctrine we have, on on holy living revelation we have. 
that is only a small portion of the whole body that the Lord encapsulates in this statement when he says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. There are revelations of truth about ministry, how to minister, about church structure, about warfare, about winning the lost, about revival, about end time events. And all of, those, all of that's truth. In fact, Jesus said, again, I quoted this last night, I believe it was, sanctify them through thy truth, or maybe it was yesterday, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. The entire Bible is truth. And nobody becomes an expert on the Bible in their lifetime. We are, we are, we are students of the word. We are seekers for truth, but we have a promise that the Lord will guide us into all truth. I would be very, very, very frightened for any person who would declare, I have all truth. I, I, you know, the Lord, to, to say that the Lord is wise is such a ridiculously understated uh, statement that uh, it's just ridiculously understated. He is wise. The Bible says he knows our frame. He remembers our frame that it's dust of the earth. He remembers our frame. It's dust of the earth. He knows that the critical thing is that we we run the race well all the way across the finish line. In your patience, possess ye your souls. Well done. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the statement made to those who run the race and finish the race. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So we have to understand that God in his wisdom, understanding humanity, understanding flesh, knew that we needed a constant challenge to keep us focused, to keep us motivated, and so that our walk with God, our relationship with God would never be on a plateau or a downward plane. That there would always be, always be a need to grow. If you're breathing, you're supposed to be growing. When you've learned enough, you will have reached your appointed time and you're out of here. But to sit back and regurgitate the same stuff over and over and over again because it's safe and comfortable and I don't have to, I don't have to be challenged and I don't have to challenge anybody else actually tends toward carnality and eventually backsliding. So a church that's constantly preaching Acts 2.38 and constantly preaching separation and that's their, and pro- constantly preaching one God to the same people over and over again, week after week, month after month, year after year, that church is already twice dead, plucked up by the, tru- the roots, even though the stuff being preached is true. There's no growing. There's no growing. Paul said clearly in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. The Greek word there is uh, uh, to maturity, to completion, and to fruitfulness. Those are the definitions of the Greek word translated perfection. Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work, of faith toward God, the doctrine singular, baptisms plural, laying on of hands eternal uh, 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 judgment and resurrection, or uh, resurrection, eternal judgment, however it is. There's seven principles. We're supposed to get there, believe those, lay the foundation, and then build something on the foundation. 
We are not sitting exposed to the elements today inside the boundaries of some footers and a foundation and a slab. We, we put in the foundation. But we built something on it. We've only been working on foundational doctrines for a hundred years this year, this coming year. 2013 was the first time baptism in Jesus' name was preached among the new Pentecostal movement in Aurora Seco camp meeting in California. hundred years next year. How long does it take to get a foundation right? How long does it take to begin to build revelation of truth on top of that? When he said leave in the principle of the doctrine of Christ, he wasn't talking about abandoning the foundation. You don't abandon a foundation. You use a foundation for what a foundation is intended for. You build something on it. <laughs> yeah, it's safe to preach Acts 2.38. And you can get people to go through the motions, getting up, shouting and dancing and running around, preach Acts 2, 38, 38, the oneness of God. And I love that stuff. I love to teach that more than anything else in the world. That's absolutely the truth. I love to teach salvation doctrine and the oneness of God more than any other single subject, period. I love it. And it's not that you can exhaust the subject. It's just that it's foundational revelation. You're supposed to be going someplace from there. But we don't do that. It's just regurgitated over and over and over again until we get into this rut and we convince ourselves we're okay when we're not growing. We're not growing spiritually. We're not growing numerically. We're not growing. People aren't getting saved. I mean, there's only 7.5 billion people in the world. And we know that none of them are hungry for truth. And none of them want to know God. So we sit in our little cloister. I'm off on it this morning, aren't I? Wow. Phew. <laughs> We're off in our little clustered buildings, and we preach to each other and shout over what we've got nobody else has got and that we've concluded nobody else wants. And the problem is we truly are ignorant of the Word of God. Not because we don't have the ability to know, because we don't care to know, because we got a nice, safe little doctrine that we can pull the strings on the mar uh, play the marionette, pull the strings, and the saints will dance. And we all go home feeling good because we've had good church. I feel better. Thank you. We're supposed to have a revelation of all truth. All truth. I am not willing to settle for some truth. I, I have never studied to answer anybody else's question ever in my life. I have always studied to answer my own questions. But this is the most beautiful thing about God. The more answers he gives me to my questions, the more questions he gives me. Standing here today after some, well, I've been studying the scripture seriously since I was 18 years old. And I'm being very honest there. I never studied the scripture seriously when I was home. But my, during, starting in my first year of college, I had to have answers for me. And from that day and time, I have never studied the scripture to answer anybody else's question but my own. And I'm standing here to tell you that after almost four, about 48 years of study, coming up on 49 years of study with this next birthday, that was the first time I'd ever been, ever had a study Bible. I got that for my 19th birthday. No, that will be 48. I'll be 67. So I'm coming up on 48 years of serious, the best I can do, Bible study. 
And with all the questions the Lord's answered, I have more questions today, quantitatively, and I hope qualitatively, than I've ever had in my life. So there's no reason to stop studying. There's no place to draw a line and say, I have arrived. And I want to know. <laughs> I, I thought I was the only person in the world that believed this till I got a hold of a, a book by G.T. Haywood. I, you know, I wanted to know if there was life on other planets. I found out scripturally the, the, the correct biblical answer to that is not yet. What does that matter? It doesn't matter to you. I could care less. You know, it doesn't even matter. I, I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether it matters to you at all. It mattered to me. I wanted to know. And the church is the only, or the, is the only people in eternity that's going to have a glorified body. After the end of the millennium, after the great white throne judgment, there are going to be human beings on earth with no sin, no death, no sickness, and they're going to be marrying and having children. If you think we've got a population problem now, what's going to happen then? And I believe that the Scripture strongly intimates that there will be colonies of people transferred from this seedbed of the universe called Earth and that there are untold numbers of solar systems out there with planets revolving around them at exactly the same distance from that star, that sun, in, in, in terms of not necessarily exact miles, but in, in proportion to the size of the sun, however far that planet's got to be able to be to sustain life. And how do I know that? Well, here's one verse for you. You know, we always quote, we, 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 we quote this, we, we stop quoting this verse uh, with our little uh, candy stick. And it's a wonderful verse, and I love it with everything in me, but it's only half of the statement or the prophecy that's made, and that's Isaiah 9 and 6, right? Isaiah, okay, you can come up now. Isaiah. What is the problem here? Isaiah, I'd love to just flip to the page, but it doesn't work, does it? All right, Isaiah 96 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase... Of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, <laughs> you can just casually read that and go, huh? And just go on to something else. Get your newspaper out and read that trash. I mean, some of you, you know how much time some of y'all wasted following every little tidbit about the election for the last year? You wasted your life. All you read about was people guessing at the outcome and some of you poured over it and consumed it like it was gospel truth. Well, you can think what you want to of me, but I never read any of it on purpose. I didn't want to get caught up in the spirit of it. I'm not of this world. I... 
I, I, I really could care less about it. So you read this little verse, and we know what the previous one says because it's part of our candy stick, you see. Us one God apostolics, that's our candy stick. And we believe that's absolute truth, but we don't have a clue what the next verse is talking about, which is based on the previous verse. Because it doesn't make sense to us. How can there be increase of his government without end? I mean, earth is finite. If there was a one world government, that's as far as that government can increase. That's it. Or you can build bigger government. I don't care if everybody worked for the government every day. It's finite. There's an end to it. So is this a rhetorical statement? Or is this a literal statement? Well, if it's, if it's rhetorical and, and, and not literal... Then let me tell you some other stuff that's rhetorical and not literal. He, he's not literally the wonderful counselor. He's not literally the mighty God. He's not literally the everlasting father. He's not literally the prince of peace. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. And, and the Lord showed me this stuff and I'm going, Wow. I didn't talk it very much because I thought people would think I was absolutely, absolutely crazy. I still don't talk it very much. But uh, I got a hold of a book by G.T. Haywood. He said the same exact stuff. And I'm going, well, there's two of us that's crazy. By a man's opinion. The point I make it is I got questions. I don't care if I ever teach them. I want answers. I'd like to understand stuff. I want to know God. I want to know how he thinks. I want to know what his purposes are. I understand that, that he's infinite I'm finite, and I can never get there. That's the idea. I'm almost 67 years old. I'm not bored. I'm not done. And I feel like I only know a fraction of what's available to be known. So what, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? We're going to just go through the motions? I'm really trying to get to the point, but this is introduction, I guess, huh? The point is, It's not that we need to find out how to do better what we're doing. We need to acknowledge that what we're doing is not working. And there's a reason it's not working. Because it's based on religious tradition. It's not based on the book. I, I had a, a good friend say to me, you know, I, I don't understand how you have been so effective at motivating people to get involved with witnessing and winning souls. And I just can't do it. I said to my friend, well, the difference is we don't believe the same thing. Oh, yeah, we do. I said, no, we don't. You believe soul winning is optional. But I can sit here and give you a list without even commenting on the scriptures. For the next 30 minutes, a list of scriptures that proves that if, you don't, if you're not involved with the lost, you're not saved. <clears throat> but we don't preach that, you see, because, we, because we, these people are part of the crowd and they, they, they look right and spit white. And, and uh, that's old, old language. means they don't dip, snuff, you know. I, I couldn't help that. It just was there and came out. I, you know, it's, it's not even my terminology, but it's there. Um, and, 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 and 
you know, they, they're faithful and they'll, they'll help out around the church and all that. And we don't want to believe they're saved even though we can't get them involved in doing anything spiritual. And, and if we preach to them that they have to be involved with the lost because that's the proof of the evidence they're truly saved, not just the fact they still speak with tongues or they look right on the outside, we're afraid they'll leave. And then we'll lose that body in the crowd and we'll lose that income. Let me give you some. Holy Ghost mathematics. Okay? Holy Ghost mathematics. This is called theoretical mathematics because it uses concepts and ideas. It doesn't use numbers. All right? But this is math. Okay. Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and save the lost. If I don't have the Spirit of Christ, I'm not His. Christ in me is the hope of glory or the self-manifestation and self-revelation of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His mission is to seek and save the lost. If I say I'm saved, Christ is in me. Christ cannot change. That means I'm involved with seeking and saving the lost. That also means if I'm not involved with seeking and saving the lost, Christ is not in me because Christ can't be in me and change. So Christ can't change. And Christ is in me. And Christ came to seek and save the lost. Which means if that's his mission and he's in me and he can't change, that means I am involved with seeking and saving the lost. And if I'm not, Christ isn't in me. Now, the problem you all have is this. You can't argue with that. It can't be argued with. But the problem is, how many preachers you know preaching that? How many apostolic preachers you know preaching that? Not happening. <laughs> Boy, I am, I'm not going to say that. I'm just following the Holy Ghost and I'm not apologizing for it. John 15, John 15, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. Oh, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, wait just a minute. Fruit looks like and is of the substance and nature of what produced it. That which is produced by the Spirit is of the Spirit. But we know that no matter that life flows up into the trunk of that vine and then out through the branch of that vine, what is produced at the end of that branch doesn't look like sap. It is the reproduction of what produced the vine. Not what flows in the vine 
to produce the fruit. So that, those eight verses in John 15 are not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. They're talking about the branches reproducing what, if planted, will produce something that looks like them. Branches. Why do we argue against that? Because if we don't argue against it, there's only one conclusion you can come to. Every branch in me that's not fruitful is cut off and cast into the fire. <laughs> but we preach a person, if a person repents of their sins, baptizes each day, and filled with the Holy Ghost, comes to church faithfully, pays their tithes, gives in their offerings, and, and looks holy on the outside, and, and doesn't cause any trouble, and they'll show up for work days at the church and other stuff like that, they are saved, and that's a lie. That is absolutely false doctrine because partial truth is not truth. And those things are only true if the rest of the truth is preached with it. Now you know why I like to talk about this stuff to small crowds. Minimizes the damage. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and I, I understand. I, I don't know. I, I don't you know. You know. You know. I've been doing this a while, and I understand that there might be another way to say that, so it's more palatable. But would you want something? Would you? Would you want someone? Uh, if if you your if your child was in a house that was on fire, would you want someone to call? the fire department and say it like this. Uh, hello, fire department. We have a slight problem here. I know you're probably busy eating or maybe you just got up from your nap. So I, I don't want you to be to feel any pressure here, fire department. I, just, just be calm, take your time. But when you can get around to it, if, if you can, if you can't work us in, that's okay. But our house is on fire and our kids are trapped inside, and we understand if it's not your priority, they, that's fine. You're, you're, just as long as you look like firemen and you're in a firehouse and, 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 and all that, then that's good enough. And we just want to make sure we communicate with you firemen in a very gentle and unexcited way because we don't want you to be offended by our concern. Excuse me. The book says, freely receive, freely give. Either we have received and we're refusing to give, or maybe we didn't really get what we claim we've got. Because if I have freely received it, how can I hold it back? And you tell me how the same 25 can meet in the same building over and over and over and over and over and over again. And somebody not scream and spit and holler and turn chairs over. Oh, we don't want to do that. It might sound a little bit too much like Jesus When they turned his house into something he didn't intend for it to be. You know something? That was the day where the first decisions were made. We got to get rid of this guy, he's causing trouble. He just disrupted our whole system of doing business because we preach sacrifices. 
But we get a cut of all this stuff going on out here that makes it easy on these folks to come, bring a little money, and conveniently buy a sacrifice and bring it in here and offer it. And he has just messed up our whole program. We got to get rid of this guy. He wasn't crucified because he said he was God. He was crucified because he was messing up their world. He was stirring up their little playhouse. And he wouldn't play fair. He wouldn't go by their rules. Why? I'm not sure that some of them were truly called. You know, I know in the Old Testament in the priesthood, you had to be born into the priesthood to be in the priesthood. And there's a little bit of that in the New Testament, especially in the United Pentecostal Church. You got to be born into the ministry. Well, that leaves me out. Because my parents weren't preachers. In fact, in fact, uh, I was the superintendent of the board with my mom and dad came in for their licenses, first license. Whew, I felt, you don't know how much better I felt after that. I was finally the son of a preacher and had a chance to get someplace. I just had to pray my own dad through the Holy Ghost to become the son of a preacher. I, I, trust me, I haven't had a bad morning. And nobody's more shocked than I am over the tenor, tone, and direction of this right now. Because I didn't feel any of this when I walked up here. So the only thing I can assume, and I'm, I'm, ex I'm believing this, you can do what you want to with it, but the Holy Ghost is trying to talk to us. Because when I lay this mic down and sit down, I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to go in the office and snap at my wife or kick, the do kick a dog or <clears throat> shove little children out of the way. barge and throw everybody out of the way that may be trying to get a cookie that I'm after. This is, these aren't my feelings, I'm sorry. This is not my emotion. You can do with that what you want to, but I know. I came in this place today still in the euphoria of what God did last night. In all the teaching I've done on warfare, we've never had a session like that. I didn't orchestrate that. I just, the Lord said, let's do it. And it happened, and lives were changed, and things happened in this room last night that have been needing to happen in some lives for a long time. And I came in here in the euphoria of that with, with, with some scripture and a, a direction, and I opened my mouth, and here this stuff starts coming. I didn't preconceive it, pre-plan it, work myself up to it. And again, when I lay this microphone down, I'm going to be fine. But if you really commit to hearing what the Lord's saying and you have pledged by his grace, not to add to or take away from what he's saying. And you also understand that if he has something to say, he probably has some feelings with which to say it. A conduit doesn't tell the source what to deliver through it. 
what flow it should choose, the rate of flow, or the direction of it. Conduit just flows. You say, well, you're not taking any responsibility for this. Oh, well, unfortunately, whether I take any responsibility for it or not, I'll be given responsibility for it. Won't be the first time. What happens? What, what would happen, those of you that are pastors here, if you go home and you start preaching this and, 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 and most of your crowd leaves? Surely you wouldn't have any way to relate to Jesus on that. Surely he never did anything like that. Surely Jesus never had anything that was so important to say. He said it even though most of his crowd left. Surely there would be a no, no identification with Jesus like that. We've been, uh, we've been doing a multiple congregation church for, oh man, probably 18 years now. And uh, we've had 42 different men at times lead various congregations. We were up to 21 different Sunday morning congregations, and we've consolidated four of them in two, and we've got two others that uh, one is autonomous, the other is about to go autonomous, so we're going to be down to seven, all the way down to 17 different congregations. But 42 men, different men have led those. Well, we've, we've actually had different congregations, about 32. And uh, some of those men, they were good men, but they weren't cut out for it. You know why? The ones that failed were the ones that were too concerned about what the people thought of them, too interested in the people liking them, and not interested enough in what God wanted to say through them. And when we recognized that that man was too concerned with people liking him, we knew he wasn't qualified to be a pastor, and we removed him. Gave him other work to do. Good people with valid ministries, they just weren't qualified to be a pastor because they were too concerned about being liked by their people and too afraid to preach the truth, afraid they'd offend somebody. Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Oh, praise God. He also said, follow me. As I follow Christ, that was my, let me, get, let me give you the up-to-date term. That was my segue back to the scripture I wanted to read. Paul's call, which was his commissioning. And I'm going to say this to you. Whether you're saint or, one of the, or you're called to a, one of the fivefold ministry. This is the detailed job description of a New Testament believer. The difference is some are called that to do that while also leading flocks of people. And others will not lead the flock. They will just focus on winning the lost and caring for the the people. The, the five-fold ministry is the father dimension of ministry and home Bible studies and what we call care groups or home groups and caring for new converts. All of that is the mother dimension of, of ministry. So Acts 26, 13. Finally, if you're ready to go there with me. 
I'm reading from my text, so you'll have to stay up with me. <clears throat> At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Praise God. It's important to note that according to the United, United Bible Society Translators Handbook, that uh, it should be pointed out that verses 16 through 18 comprise one sentence in the Greek. Also of importance for these three verses is the number of Old Testament allusions that Paul makes. Let me say this to you also. This is the most detailed account anywhere in the book of Acts or the epistles of exactly what God said to Paul on the road to Damascus. Even in the earlier account of the actual event, there wasn't near this kind of detail supplied by Luke in his writings of the event when Paul first encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. I'm going to say to you one more time, Paul said to all of us, not just to preachers. He wrote, I believe it was to the Corinthian church, if I remember correctly. Uh, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, I would like to be a Paulian rather than a Christian. Because the Greek actually, actually literally means there, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Uh, the term Christian means Christ-like. And uh, frankly, it is Christianity is far below God's intention for us. We are not trying to be like Christ. We're not trying to imitate Christ. We're not trying to copy Christ. We are trying to reach the goal of being dead and instead of trying to live like Christ, letting Christ do the living through us. Of course, in the process of growing in God, we have to go through the first to find out it does work before we will finally be willing to Seek for and allow the second. Galatians 2.20, of course, says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that, I, life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So crucifixion, is uh, this crucifixion is not talking about the, experiencing the death, burial, and resurrection that takes you from being an unregenerate person to being in the body of Christ. Paul said, I travail in birth again for you till Christ be, forms in you, be formed in you. Galatians 2.20 is Paul saying that same thing another way. This second 
experience with crucifixion. One takes you out of darkness into his light. The other takes you out of yourself and lets him do the living. It is a completely uh, different experience than salvation. It is actually a greater transition because when I came out of darkness into light, when I came out of sin into his body, the transition was he took away my past and gave me a new life, but it was still me. It was still me. Still my concepts, still my ideas, still my priorities. And so at that point in time, he begins to work in me and on me to bring me to the place that I finally give up. Not give up on God, but give up on me. And that's called crucifixion. I finally die to me and let him live. And that's a process. And I'm an extremely stubborn guy. And uh, my right lineage, uh, my dad was one of uh, 12 children, 11 that lived. Uh, the oldest boy died uh, as a small baby. But of those 11, including my dad, they were they're ever one very independent, self-sufficient people. And it, by nature, uh, I got every bit of that. So the Lord and I have had quite a little wrestling match for many, many years before I finally gave up because there was nothing left to do but walk away or give up on me. I don't recommend that. I, I really don't recommend prolonging it that long I don't it's wasn't fun <laughs> it was mostly painful but he loved me enough to never quit on me as long as I don't didn't quit on him he wasn't gonna quit on me so you understand here that part of, the, part of the involvement with a loss is part of the dying process. Because people first come to God, they don't, know, they don't know that much about Scripture or whatever, but they're so excited about this new experience, and they go out and they tell their friends and neighbors to get them to come to church. You can't call that soul winning. It's just witnessing. That's not the same thing. In a court of law, a witness sits on, a, on the witness stand and simply tells what they've experienced. What they know by experience, not what they know from expertise. Then a lawyer who knows the law takes the testimony and the evidence presented in testimony and convinces the jury to come to a certain verdict. Witnesses do not argue law with a jury. So a person comes to God, and this is a wonderful thing, and they go out and tell mom and dad and brothers and sisters and friends and neighbors and all that, and a certain percentage of them will recognize, hey, this is something's happened to this person. They're different. I better go check out what's going on. And they come, and they respond. That is not soul winning. It is strictly witnessing, just telling your experience. But God expects us to grow from being a witness to a soul winner, someone that knows the word of God enough to take their personal testimony and their personal experience and connect it with the word of God enough to convince now, we can't convince everybody because ultimately even God can't do that because a person has to be willing to be convinced. But bottom line, that's, that's the process, you see. So that's why everybody that received the Holy Ghost is supposed to be a witness. You don't have to know the Bible to be a witness. Tell somebody what happened to you. 
I once was lost, I'm now found. I once was empty, I'm now full. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know enough about the Bible. You don't want to talk Bible. Because if somebody already has a faith and you're talking Bible, they'll argue Bible with you. But they, they'd have to look you in the face, call you a liar, say you didn't experience what you experienced. So you become a witness. You become a witness, but in the growth and the process, you learn the word of God, and in the dying process, you reach, eventually reach the place that you're a soul winner. Well, what's the connection there? Except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. You understand something here? The statement I'm about to make is not a judgment. It's only intended to show you your GPS position in the journey. Okay? If I start here and I'm supposed to end up here, <laughs> I, I, you know, GPS is a wonderful thing. It really is, I, you know, unless the big brother's tracking you. No, some of y'all are way too young to know who big brother is. That's a reference to the book 1984, George Orwell, and big brother is the government spying on the citizens. Well, that book is so elementary now and ridiculously obsolete that... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'll just throw this one out there. If you're worried about the mark of the beast, I'm not. If they could come up with a chip and they said they could put that in my hand, I would never have to carry a wallet again. And all my credit card numbers and everything would be there and all I have to swipe it, do is swipe it. I'd do it right now. Mark of the beast. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. You're missing a biblical point. The beast can't be the beast till the church is gone. And you can't have a mark of the beast till after there's a beast. Uh, I probably really wouldn't do that, but I was just making a point. But the problem is, I mean, we, we have people in this room right now who uh, have jobs with the government, and uh, the law says they can't track U.S. citizens. I won't comment on that, but the bottom line is, <laughs> one brother told me, they could drive up in your driveway with your computer turned off and sitting in your driveway, turn your computer on and access all of your files without ever entering your house. Hallelujah. So if you're worried about, if you're going to call that the mark of the beast, you can't see it yet, but there's a 666 in your forehead already. <laughs> so if I'm going to have any peace, I've got to understand what the scripture says. There can't be a beast till after, there can't be a mark of the beast till after there's a beast. There can't be a beast while the church is on earth. Now, of course, if you believe the church is going through tribulation, uh, you better get your, all your credit cards and all your phones, your computers, your iPads. Well, it, that must be why people are moving to the woods, living in caves with no electronics, with all kind of food stored and a bunch of weapons because the beast is coming to get them. I guess they, I, what else would you do if you're going to go through tribulation? I wouldn't be standing here if I believed I was going through tribulation. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm off the subject, so I'm back here. Okay, Whew, enough of that. Praise God. Just a little prod there to get you thinking. Just, just, just poke you a little bit here. Let's go back over here. So, anyway, <laughs> uh, let me take a drink. So what I was saying was, here's your GPS position. If you're not producing any fruit, but you love God and you're trying to be faithful to God, the Word of God tells me where you are. You're not dead yet. Because if a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, Except a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And that Greek word much is the exact same uh, Greek adjective that's translated in Matthew 9, 38. The harvest truly is plenteous. Same word as plenteous. Much fruit and plenteous harvest are the same exact Greek word. So, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit, plenteous fruit. So, that's our GPS position. Okay? God's positioning system. <laughs> that was a poor attempt at that, but that's the best I could do. That was the top of my head right here. So, Paul, by Jesus, Jesus himself, and this is what's so amazing. Paul implies that he is, no, he doesn't imply, he actually says it. He says, the voice of the one that appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he says he's quoting what Jesus said. He's not giving an opinion about what Jesus says. He actually says he's quoting what Jesus said. So this is a very specific commissioning, call and commissioning. Uh, Young's literal translation is not easy reading, but I like it as one of my study translations because uh, he really, uh, Mr. Young, uh, really did attempt to literally translate the Greek rather than translate for readability. So I'm reading to you Acts 20, the, 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 the one sentence that's written in three verses, uh, Acts 26, 16 through 18, Young's little translation. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for for this I appeared to thee. To appoint thee an officer and a witness, both of the things thou didst see and of the things in which I will appear to thee, delivering thee from the people and the nations to whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the authority of the adversary unto God for their receiving forgiveness of sins and and a lot among a lot or a portion of share among those having been sanctified by faith that is toward thee now i know that's not easy reading and it's not easy listening but if you will permit me then we will now study these three verses or begin to uh, it's 11.06, and I can tell you right now, I will be teaching on these verses the rest of this session, and I will be teaching on these verses this afternoon, and if I don't finish, the Lord willing, I'm going to be teaching on them tomorrow till I get done. Why? Because this is a mandate to the church that's not being preached. When God showed me these verses last year when I was studying to call for war, 
I'd never really seen them. I'd read them, obviously. I had to read them to get my license. <laughs> but I'd never seen them. I, I realized last year that if we recognize these verses for what they are, and we endeavored by the, by the grace of God to put them into practice in our lives and in our churches, everything would be different. Because this te- these verses not only tell us why we're not seeing what we are believing for, but tells us how to have a systematic approach for how to have what we're believing for. And everything we're doing that will not fit and does not fit in these principles dictated by Jesus to Paul is a waste of time. Now I said that really gently. I'd like to have said that stronger. For me that was gentle. As gentle as I could say that. It's a waste of time. Okay. Verse 20, chapter 26, verse 16. And again, this is really important. I want to say to you again what the United Bible Society Translators Handbook said. Because we've got to come back to this. We We always have to remind ourselves of this when we're studying the Bible. The chapter divisions and the verse divisions in our Bible was not divinely inspired. But we allow those allow ourselves to pick parts of a sentence out and focus on that part of a sentence, and we wouldn't do that in any other area of life. We wouldn't do it. We understand that if we say something in a sentence and somebody, you know, uh, let's say, let let me say, uh, the lights in here are very bright and uh, uh, they're hurting my eyes. And, And I could say, well, the lights are bright. Well, that's not what I said. That's not a great example. Best I could do right this second. It, it, it's, it's not. You, you can take something out of a part of a sentence. You can take a part of a sentence out of a sentence. And if you focus on that point, you, you, you know, the media, our, the media in this country does that all the time. They call sound bites. And you've always got people saying, that's not what I said. But they're playing your voice saying it. The problem is they didn't play the whole sentence or the context in which you said that. And all they've got to do is take that bite out of there and change everything. We, why do we do that? We condemn the media for doing it. We do it in church all the time. This is really a bad example. But years ago, there was a preacher. I don't know him personally, but uh, I was told he was a good man. But uh, he, uh, he believed that women ought to wear their hair up. He, he wasn't really educated. He was reading the scripture one day where the Lord said, uh, whenever you see this sign, let those that are on the housetop not come down. And he got up and preached. Top knot, come down. Meaning don't take your hair down. This is true. This really happened. He took that portion out of that scripture that said that when you see this stuff happening, if you're on the housetop, not come down. Flee into the wilderness, et cetera. So it's talking about Israel fleeing into the wilderness because the Antichrist is coming, whatever. But he took that one verse, top not come down. And preached about a woman wearing her hair up.
Now, we can laugh and shake our heads and hope it's not true. Unfortunately, it's true. And, and, it, and maybe that's an extreme example, but the problem is that's what we do. That's what we do. And we do it, I, I, I'd like to think innocently, because we just forget that the verse divisions and the chapter divisions were not in the original, and that's not... If I write a letter to somebody, I don't break everything I say down into uh, sentences that I number. Or I've been accused of writing too long of sentences. I don't divide them up into two separate numbered sections. Nobody writes and talks like that. And I understand it was done for reference sake so you could quickly identify a place that you want to remember that you had studied. And that's wonderful. Until we let it affect how we approach the Scripture and what we understand from the Scripture. So you understand, please, I said all of that to say this, you understand that when I, when I start on this first verse here, this first verse, that I understand and want you to remember that this is only one-third of a sentence. Okay? So, Acts 26, 16. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which in the which I will appear unto thee. Uh, the amplified version of that verse reads this way. <clears throat> but arise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, that I might appoint you to serve as my minister and to bear witness <coughs> both to what you have seen of me and to that in which I will appear to you. Weymouth's translation of the New Testament says it this way. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared for you, appeared to you for the very purpose of appointing you my servant and my witness both as to the things which you have already seen and as to those in which I will appear to you. Paul was arrested by the Lord for the purpose of making or appointing or commissioning him to the offices of servant and witness. Those are two separate functions. But he was called to that. The Greek word translated for there uh, is the preposition. It means to or into. Figuratively, purpose or result. For this cause, for this purpose, to this end. So the Lord's calling Paul was for a purpose. He was called for a purpose to the purpose. And the two offices he was called to was for the purpose of fulfilling the purpose. And, and the uh, word translated to make, to make thee, uh, is the word in the middle voice that means to take into one's hand to determine a point beforehand it's translated appointed or to appoint. The Lord said to Paul, uh, or Luke quoted what the Lord said to Paul in Acts 9, uh, 15 and 16 in the original account of this happening. Go thy way for he, uh, the Lord said unto him, go thy way for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the, excuse me. This is what the Lord said to Ananias when he was trying to get him to go pray for Paul. Or Saul, the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. A chosen vessel. Now, if you will permit me to do this without hopefully thinking that I am stretching this beyond measure, I do not believe that Paul was called to a unique calling. He did tell me and you to follow him as he followed Christ. 
And when you study the calling that Jesus gave to Paul as specified and detailed in Acts 26, and then you read the writings of Paul, you will see that he gave structure uh, instruction on each one of those elements in many, many different places in his writings. He was communicating those things to the churches. Further verifying the fact that this was not a calling unique to him alone. In fact, Paul went so far as to say to Timothy, you pick out faithful men that you can impart to them the things you that I've imparted to you and the definition of their faithfulness is they will impart to others. So you got at least four different levels of impartation there. What I receive, I gave to you, Timothy. I want you to pick out men that are faithful. Not to be recipients, but to be conduits. I want you to pick men that you can pass this to that you know they will pass it on. The Lord gives us all revelations. And I have a single prayer that I pray every time I am, sometimes even while I'm, any time that I'm teaching or ministering with a spirit of revelation, I have a prayer. Lord, I'm not willing to be the conduit for this without believing for your grace to enable me to walk in this. The point I'm making is, especially when you're ministering with a spirit of revelation, you are not talking about to people about stuff that you're dotting the I's across the T's on. You're not doing it. The Lord said the Old Testament prophets, through the apostle Peter, he said, they, they prophesied, about, prophesied about stuff they didn't even understand. Well, in the New Testament, and I've said this to the ministers in this church, and I've pounded this into my sons, you can't refuse to preach a message just because you're not practicing it. You can't wait till you've got it all down and got it all perfected in your life before you preach it. That's not what this is about. There is, I don't know anybody to be qualified to preach anything. If the Lord wanted perfect ministers ministering to his people, he'd have angels doing it. So I can't stand here and minister to you, whether by knowledge or by revelation, either one and Proposed to be someone who has got it all down and I got, this, I got this worked out. Most of it I have experienced at times. Some of it I've experienced more frequently than that. But it's the Lord speaks to us. That's, that's one of the most significant things that confirms to me that God is speaking. Is when, when he gives me stuff to say that he knows and that I know he knows, I'm not doing like I should, should need to be, be doing, doing. That I haven't got figured out like I need to be figured out. And yet he doesn't give me the option of whether or not to say it. And that's the thing, see. I, I, I can't stand and talk in a monotone. If I feel something strongly... You know, I'm going to be animated and my voice is going to be whatever and I'm projecting whatever this is. And, 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 and then people, people assumed that my delivery at the least connotes, if not denotes, judging, judging somebody. You can't judge somebody over something that you're not doing 
or at least not doing it perfectly. And therefore, since I don't know any preachers doing any of it perfectly, there's no such thing as a preacher judging people. There may be some guys that do it, but they're in trouble with Jesus. So therefore, people, the scripture says, take heed how you hear. There really does have to be a separation in the hearts and minds and spirits of the hearer between what's said and the earthen vessel that's the conduit. We don't want to do that, you know. You don't have a right to tell me that. I don't have a right to say anything. I don't have a right to stand up here. Are you kidding I have a right to be in the building. Well, let's get down to it. I don't have a right to be breathing. You? So, I don't even know why this is so important. I don't know if it's because you're here or some of that's watching online or some of that will be watching this archive sometime later. I don't know. But I, I, I'm just feeling, I have felt a couple times, and I'm not being defensive. That's because I'm not apologizing. I am trying to explain, but I'm not apologizing. And I'm not about to quit. <laughs> I'm not stopping what I'm doing. I'm just trying to explain something. You know, it's easy to, 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 to put personality in something and persona in it when that's really not what's happening at all. What if it really is God saying this stuff this strongly to us? Not because he's angry with us, but because he is that desperate and urgent, feels an urgency, that amount of urgency for us to hear it and receive it. What if it really is God? What if that really is God? And we sit there, we want to make it human and personal and all this kind of stuff and, and excuse ourselves for rejecting it rather than hearing the word and mixing it with faith so they could be profitable to us. I got to admit to you, I'm really, <laughs> I'm not upset that the Lord is not letting me start into this right at this moment. Because there's some really heavy stuff in these verses. <laughs> and you, th <laughs> the problem is, if you think I've been talking heavy stuff, it is all frosting compared to the cake. This is, there's heavy stuff here. It's heavy stuff. It's heavy stuff. Is there anyone here not called to be a servant? Is there anybody here not called to be a witness? Well, let's find out. I can't pronounce the Greek word, but the Greek word translated minister in this verse, huperates, I guess, uh, specifically refers to someone who takes orders from his superior and does exactly what he is told to do without any right to initiate action on his own. I got to say, read that again. There are several different Greek, Greek words that are Translated by the English word minister, to minister, servant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There, there's, there's a bunch of them. This one is one of the least used in the Greek New Testament, but it is, it is an amazing word. When Paul, when the Lord said to Paul, "I have, I have visited you for this purpose." to make you, to appoint you, to commission you a minister. It was huperates. Specifically, this Greek word refers to someone who takes orders from his superior and does exactly what he's told to do and has no right to initiate actions or words on his own. I've had times.
where I've done this and I was doing the exact perfect will of God. Well, you're not doing something. He didn't tell me something to do. Well, I need to get up and do something. Can't just sit here. This can't be pleasing to God. Really? If I, Paul was appointed to be a minister who was not given any right to initiate any words or actions on his own. You don't think God tests us to see if we're going to do something? Years ago, there was a meeting that was powerfully used. The name of that meeting was a deeper life. It was deeper life. Deeper life conferences. They were powerfully used. They were, they were powerfully used. But there was a there was something said in those meetings that that particular thing said wasn't God. And I understood what the, what the men were trying to say when they said it. But what they said wasn't true. You need to go home from this meeting and make something happen. Go home and make something happen. Don't just sit there and let nothing happen. Make something happen. Really? Really? I'm going to make God do something? If I'm not making God do it, then whatever I'm doing is not of God, and whatever happens didn't come from God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And Jesus said, Every tree that your heavenly Father did not plant shall be rooted up. It happens all the time. Guys, guys want to see something happen, and so and so, some places, they're, they're using a certain program or a methodology, and it seems to be working for them. And, and, and they learn how to do that, and they come home and try to do that exact same thing where they are because they're trying to make it work. They didn't ask if that was the will of God or how the, if it was the will of God exactly, how do you want me to, to do it here? It's just, that's working there, let's go work it here. I mean, hey, we don't have youth pastors anymore. We've got student pastors. Oh, really? Well, that's a pretty demeaning term. Because what if you're out of school at 18 and you're no longer a student, then you must not have a pastor. I understand the concept, but it didn't originate, originate in the apostolic church, originated out in the denominal world. And it's a, it's a, it's a term that is uh, uh, dividing, classifies people. Well, what about this extreme? Somebody gets there, uh, finishes high school early at 16, doesn't go to school after that. They're in the age of being a part of the student pastor's group, but they're not a student. What was wrong with young people? <laughs> What's wrong with young adult? Why do we have to come up with the term stupid, I mean stu student pastor? Why do we have to come up with that? Because it's new, it's different. And somebody in Atlanta that has 20,000, 30,000 people, they use stupid, I mean, student pastor. And so we're going to adopt that blindly because it's cool. Give me a break, folks. Give me a break. Better yet, give God a break. I, I, I don't want to grind this to powder, but apparently I am. Uh, or ho hopefully God is. This word, you know why I love the Greek? Greek is the language of science. It is very specific. In English, we say love. I love this pulpit. Man, I had an oatmeal cookie this morning. I love that cookie. I love my car. I love my grandchildren. I love my kids. 
My son's my daughter's law. I love my wife. I love God. And there's not a person sitting here that thinks any of those statements is equivalent. We understand that I meant something completely different by love with every single one of those statements. But in the Greek, it doesn't happen like that at all. There's a word for loving this pulpit, a word for loving that oatmeal cookie, a word for loving my car, my grandchildren, my kids, my wife, and God. It's all different. That's why I like it. This is, this is really amazing. Just, just a little tidbit you can do with it. Hebrew is not a precise language, and it's extremely emotional. And God choose, chose to use a language like that to write the very rigid principles of the law. And the New Testament is about grace, mercy, tongue talking. And he chose the most precise language to write about all of that. He balanced out the content with the language. So here I am again. This word is what Paul was called to. You and I are called to this ministry. I talked to you yesterday about, you know, you de dealing with dying out to your flesh in the first pattern of prayer and the second pattern of prayer. You're, you're, you're humbling yourself. You're laying down your will, taking up his will, et cetera, et cetera, so you can become a conduit in the third pattern of prayer. And, 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 and here it is, folks. This word sums every bit of that up. And I have people, you know, it's always, you, you know, same, same spirit. God gave me a brain. He expects me to use it. Really? That's amazing. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not under your own understanding. Lean not under your own, lean not under your own understanding. Lean not under your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. It sounds like I'm supposed to use my brain. I was taught decision making. You've got men under you. You have to make decisions, give orders. That's going to put them in harm's way. They got families back home. They got kids back home. They got whatever. And you, you, you are tasked with the responsibility of making decisions and giving orders that's going to put them in harm's way and possibly some of them not come home. So we were taught how to make decisions. And part of the decision-making process is you gather all the facts. If that's how you make decisions, then you can't make any. Because the most important fact that you can gather before you make a decision is what's going to happen in the next 30 seconds. What's going to happen in the next minute? What's going to happen six hours from now? What's going to happen tomorrow? You tell me how I can make a decision, a good decision, when I don't know what's about to happen. So, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to willingly surrender my right to make the decision and let the one who knows what's going to happen tomorrow tell me what to do. Brother Height, I hope this is not uncomfortable for you, but I'm, you're a perfect example. Brother Chris Height, was a Maryland State Trooper. Well, I guess you technically still are retired, right? He was a Maryland State Trooper. Riding down the road in his cruiser. Somebody, you know, how long had you been doing that? Ten years? Okay. 
I mean, you know, he's riding down the road. He wasn't a novice. He'd been doing this a while. And somebody else makes a decision, puts him in harm's way. He has a serious accident and has injuries that means he can no longer be a trooper, active. Well, he might have got up that morning and made some kind of decision on base what he was going to do that after that, that day when he got off from work or what he would plan to do the next day. Well, guess what? None of those things he planned happened because he's in the hospital. And I understand, I'm not trying to, to uh, in any way uh, trivialize his situation. It's a very perfect situation. And what Paul, God was telling Paul, you go where I tell you to go and don't you go anywhere I didn't tell you to go. And you speak when I say speak. And you don't open your mouth when I don't give you something to say. He's not ta- he wasn't talking about his just his relationships with people. He's talking about representing God as a minister, as a servant. And that word, and you can study every Greek reference that defines words you want, and they all say essentially the same thing. This word implies that this this minister that God called Paul to be had no right to initiate anything of himself. I'm stuck here right now. I'm sorry. I'm stuck right here. I don't like that. You sound like one of your kids. Tell them what to do. I don't like that. Wait, wait, wait just a minute. You may not like it, but I'm dad and you're not. I didn't preach holiness at home. Because holiness is supposed to be a direct product of relationship between you and Jesus. You can't impose relationship nor its dedication. So therefore, rather than saying to my sons, you can't do that, it, this violates holiness, and you can't do this, it violates holiness, and you've got to do that because it's holiness, I had house rules. This is my house, I'm the dad, these are the rules. Because if they had a problem, I want them to have a problem with me, not with God. I wanted them to grow in their relationship with God and come to these things uh, because it was it became their conviction. Now, I didn't use them till they come to that. Not in church, but... And if one of them wanted to vary from what's expected here, I, they'd still make my son, and I'd still love them, but they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. But I had house rules. My house, my rules. Well, I don't like that. No problem. I love you, and uh, would you like me to help you find some place to rent? And I'll help you move your stuff. Because if you're not going to live by my rules, you must be ready to support yourself. Because you're living under my roof and I'm paying the bills. My house, my rules. That's not fair. Too bad. (laughs) I'm sorry, Sue, it's too bad. Well, and I know this is literally true, but this is God's house. His rules. I don't like that. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, you are aware that all of us sitting here today are slaves. We're slaves. 
we were purchased by our master from another master. We're slaves. Now, if you had been naturally a slave and you came to Jesus, he would make you a free man. That's what the book says. But the book says if you come to Jesus as a free man, you become his slaves. It's in the book. You can look it up, New Testament. Okay? So we were slaves to sin, and he paid the redemption price. And when he purchased us, and Paul said, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Bought. I've been bought with a price. I am not my own. The trouble with most people that are tempted to be Christians, they never settle that point. They never settle that in their heart. They don't settle it. Some of you have heard this story way too many times, and I'll try to keep it brief. But I was engaged to be married to an apostolic girl. I thought she was the one. It was such a romantic thing and seemed so perfect. I assumed it had to be God. I was supposed to be in Illinois two days after graduation from the Naval Academy. Friday night, June the 7th, 1968, I was supposed to be in Illinois. Here in Illinois to marry the girl I was engaged to. In February, before that, there was a couple little things that happened. That I suddenly realized I had assumed I'd never ask God. When I asked him, he says, and I'm assuming he's just going to confirm what I already believe. He, but he didn't. He says, she's not my will for you. Oh, 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 she's got a ring. We got a date set. I, I, I'm in love. This is perfect. He says, she's not my will for you. I said, I, I cried for two weeks. I said, I can't, I can't ask for my ring back. If this is really you, have her send my ring back. And within a few days, I got an envelope that was lumpy. And my ring was in it. So on the night of June the 7th, 1968, rather than being in Illinois two days after graduation and getting married, I was in Jacksonville, Florida because I went home with my parents after graduation and my dad at the time was stationed in Jacksonville. And I go to a revival service on Friday night, June the 7th, and I walk in the back door, and there's a girl I did not know sitting at the piano playing before church. I'm 22 and a half almost, and I was all interested till I found out she was 16. A few months shy of 17, but what does 16 or 17 make? And the Lord says... That's the one. And I said, no, it's not. I'm not marrying a high school senior. He said, you and I have talked about all this. I said, we never talked about how old she was going to be. He said, that's exactly right. We didn't. And that's the one. And she happens to be sitting in that office in there. That wasn't what I wanted. Not, not, not her. I had it all planned. It was fairy book stuff. It was, it was fantasy stuff. It was perfect. Slight problem. It wasn't God's will. That girl's not even in the truth today. Because the bottom line was, what God knew that I didn't, she was raised in the church, but it was never hers. It was never her path, her, her, her life, her doctrine. And she might have made an okay wife as a, a naval officer. But it would have been a disaster with her as a preacher's wife. Nothing against her as a person. 
Just she wasn't the one. I'm not my own. Uh, you know, all these years of counseling young people about getting married, there's a single common thread. They want to make the decision. Enjoy yourself. But then when you want to come to me and counsel about how bad it's going, what am I going to say? How am I going to counsel you through the fact you married something, somebody out of the will of God? It's tough enough in the will of God. It's a challenge in the will of God. In the perfect will of God, it's a challenge. And I don't mean a one-way challenge. She didn't get any bargain. I got blinders. I can walk through my bedroom from the bathroom and out of the house, and I don't see all that stuff I got piled around that's just laying there. (laughs) There's a door on the commode closet. And uh, I looked at that this morning, and I realized, oh, some of those clothes that are stacked on top of each other hanging on that door, a couple of those have been up there a couple of months. She's really, she's amazing. Some would just go take it down because it bothers her that much. She'd just take it down and do something with it. And if she did, I'd let her. (laughs) But I might want to wear something that's hanging up there one day. And I don't want to have to walk the extra 20 feet to get to my closet. So I'll just leave it there. (laughs) I'm not making excuses. It's, it's not excusable. The point I'm making is uh, she hasn't had an easy time of it. And it was the perfect will of God. Now, talking about it, I'm going to have to go take that stuff off that door. <laughs> I can't plead be, being that blind. <laughs> Get this, Paul, Paul was an amazing fellow, Saul. He was the leading proponent of stamping out these heretics that were blasphemously coming against the truth as he had been raised to believe it was. And he was zealous, and he was sure in here that he was doing what was right. And he's, he's famous. He walks down the street and people give a look that's a mixture of fear and respect because there goes the ferocious lion of Judah taking, standing for truth and, and stamping out these heretics. And God says, wham! By the way, this one you've been persecuting, that's me. And guess what? You're now going to do exactly what I say, when I say, no more and no less. Now, let me quickly say this. The Bible does call us doulos, which is slaves or servants. The King James uses servant. But the word doulos in the Greek is slave. I'm owned. I was purchased from the master of sin, not to be free to run my own life, but I was purchased from one master by another master. That's why we call him good master. Master. I'm a slave. Slaves don't tell their master what they like and don't like. You do what he says. Of course, good thing about all that is, 
what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear. Not my problem. That all belongs to the master. I'm just a slave. I'm sick. It's his problem. Every problem, difficulty I got, it's not the slave's problem. It's the master's problem. Now, I know that's a completely different relationship than father-son, but all of these things have elements of it. It's all parts of the picture of this relationship. And that relationship there is primarily talking about us in regards to the work. It took years to get to this place of praying this. But I prayed this this morning. Father, I want to be a part of your of you today. I want to be a part of your life. I pray these exact words today. And I do most days in some form or other. I want to be a part of your life today. I want to be a part of your plan today. Part of your purpose. Part of your kingdom. Part of your work today. By your help and grace, wherever you're going, I'm going. Whatever you're saying, I'm saying. By your help and grace, I will not add to or take away from whatever you want to say. I'm yours. Do with me as you please today. There's other things, but to, that's that's another thing I've learned to pray over the last 10 years is... Uh, Paul's blessing upon the churches that he started every church with, the, the apostolic blessing, uh, grace and peace from the Father, even our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. So part of that prayer, I try every day, and sometimes I'll add to it through the day, Father, I receive grace and peace from you today. I receive grace and peace from you today. I, re I say it. I pray it. I receive grace and peace from you today. Now, the Lord's not like other masters. You want to do your own thing? He's going to let you. He's not going to hunt you down. He's not going to beat you up if you don't do what he says. He's just going to let you do what you want. And all the results are yours and yours alone. But I, we, we human beings, we human beings, we want to do it our way and take the credit as long as everything's going okay. And the moment things go wrong, we want to point our finger in God's face and, and be angry with him and blame him for letting it happen. Warfare. There's nothing about participating in warfare that is pleasurable to the flesh. Nothing. I said it yesterday sometime. Or was one of the nights, I don't remember, that to go to war, you, you understand you may die. You may die. And when you involve, uh, allow yourself to be given over to supernatural warfare, you may not die naturally, but you're participating in dying spiritually, dying out to yourself. There's a dying that takes place as warfare takes place through you. And, and it's the reason why so many Christians don't want to be involved. It cost me something. The man came up here last night, the night before. He prayed God did an awesome thing in his family. He came up here last night, and he says to me, I can't pray. I don't have any voice left. Well, wait a minute. God's about to do something for you personally, but I can't talk. Why couldn't he talk? Because the night before, in battling for his family, while it was Holy Ghost battling through him, 
the physical man took a beating to not violate a confidence or or embarrass anybody. But I had somebody tell me recently that some time back they were doing intercessory, uh, deep intercessory warfare and felt a pop. They went to the doctor and they had ruptured their diaphragm. And the doctor says, who ruptures their diaphragm? How did you do this? And he said, I, I, I didn't even try to explain it to the doctor. But the, the spirit of travail was so heavy. And he had prayed so hard that there was a physical consequence to yielding to the spirit. Well, that can't be God. How would God allow that? Well, just check the nail prints. There's a price to pay. It's not fun and games. And this point, which I'm going to quit because it's time to take a break, and I'm ready to take a break. I I don't want to try to get into something else and break it in the middle of that. But this, you have to understand what Paul, the Lord was saying to Paul. And that other office he was called to, I'll just mention this one, my last minute or two here before noon, which I will get into in a, when we come back. He said, I'm a, I called you to be a witness. The Greek word translated witness, that li, those, the English equivalent of that Greek word is the root word from which we get the word martyr. The ultimate witness is to prove that what you are attesting to is so important to you that you're willing to die for it. These were the two offices. Offices that Paul was called to. To be a servant who would go where he's supposed to go, say what he's supposed to say, and with no right to initiate anything on his own when it came to spiritual things. And to be a witness, even if it meant to the extreme, unto death. I, I know I've been doing this a while. I know this kind of stuff. It's not the stuff we just. Oh wow, we don't go talk to. Oh man, we 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 hung from the Milky Way. It was so awesome. Woo! And it almost seems like what I'm trying to do is discourage you. No. I just want you to know. Your flesh and my flesh cannot be in charge and see what God wants to, to do. Not it can't be. It can't be. It's not going to be. That's why Jesus said, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. You know where you find those verses? Immediately before the verse that says, except a grain of wheat falls in the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. That was the preamble that the Lord spoke to introduce that verse. If you save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Except that's John 12. Except a grain of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abides alone. You can read all the church books you you want, church growth books you want. You can go to all these big conferences you want, and I promise you they will not have a session on how a seed falls in the ground and dies. They'll immerse you in programs and in methodologies, but they won't even tell you the most important thing about how to have growth. Somebody's got to die. Father, I thank you. I thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus' name, I loose the spirit of faith in this place to anoint our minds, our hearts, our souls, to be able to hear the word, mix the word with faith 
and receive it that it might be profitable for your for you and your kingdom in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen